Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us on today's webinar about family caregiving and COVID-19. Before we get started, just a little bit about us and who we are. We are the National Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Family Support based out of the University of Pittsburgh. We are funded by a grant from the Administration for Community Living and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Our mission is to partner with government, academia, and the family caregiver community to transform research into services and programs. Our goal is to improve the hair, health, and quality of life of people with disabilities and the families that support them. We know that the current coronavirus pandemic brings with it fear and uncertainty, especially for family caregivers who are facing an unprecedented situation. We hope that today's webinar will provide you with some clear information and answers to questions that you might have. We will be recording the webinar today and we'll email out a link so that you're able to watch it to anyone who registered. Thank you very much to people who sent their questions in ahead of time and any questions that come up as the presenters are speaking, please just type them in to the chat window and we will cover them at the end of the presentation. Everyone who attends will receive a survey via email at the end of the presentation and we'd really appreciate it if you would fill it out to help us improve our future programming. Joining us today are three panelists who will be covering topics about coronavirus. We are joined by Kathleen Lindell from the University of Pittsburgh's Dorothy P. and Richard P. Simmons Center for Interstitial Lung Diseases at UPMC, by Gregory Chirpes, who is the Medical Director from the Department of Human Services Office of Developmental Programs, and Nancy Murray, the Senior Vice President of Achieva and the President of the Art of Radio Pittsburgh. Kicking us off will be Kathleen Lindell. Can you hear us, Kathleen? Yes. All right, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, and on cue, my home phone is ringing. Uh, <laughs> so we'll just ignore that. No uh, problem. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to everyone today, and we'll be happy to um, answer questions at the end. So the next slide. Well, now you hear my home answering machine in the background. So sorry about that. So I'd like to show you, um, introduce you to this group of people. I uh, lead the... Um, support group at the Simmons Center for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Every year we take these patients and our entire faculty and staff and patients and their caregivers go on the Gateway Clipper in Pittsburgh. For those who are not familiar with Pittsburgh, we have three rivers and we have a boat, uh, a set of boats that um, you can cruise up and down the rivers. So we do this as an activity to get people out and about. Uh, as you can see, some of these patients uh, utilize supplemental oxygen. And so this is a safe way to people, uh, for people to get out. A few things I'd like to note about this picture. First of all, everyone gives their consent. Uh, these people drive us to do what we do. And so we uh, get their picture every year and take them around the world when we give talks. Uh, the second thing is, Back when we took this picture in October, we didn't have to worry about social distancing. So everyone's pretty close there. 
And then the third thing I'd like to point out is who you don't see in this picture are the caregivers. And the caregivers are seated um, in the back um, on, at the tables. And if anything, what this has taught me is that this year when we do the boat cruise in October, we're gonna also get a separate picture of the caregivers because the caregivers are vital uh, to the care of our patients and patients all around the world. Next slide. So my first message is be kind to yourself. Caring for someone with a serious illness can be physically, financially, and emotionally exhausting. And this is on a normal day and not in a COVID pandemic. Uh, in these times, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And what, we, what I mean by that is it's really important to approach this slowly and it's very easy to get caught up in it, but we really want you to save your energy and really pace yourself. So the next slide. It's important to employ good health behaviors. We suggest eating healthy meals, getting adequate sleep, and exercising appropriately. Now, in the current situation, it's very easy to get up, caught up and think, wow, you know what, really doesn't matter what I eat now, um, or I really my sleep may not uh, be ideal, but that's okay, I can sleep tomorrow, or exercise, why should I exercise now? Well, what we do know is that when you employ good health behaviors, you feel much better and you're actually able uh, better to adapt to be able, being able to care for yourself and then also those who you care for. And I, I just need to make the comment, if you are exercising outdoor, to please wear a mask. Uh, so our next uh, slide. Use common sense. And some people will say, okay, sure, that, you know, that makes sense. And I think it's really important to give yourself credit. You've made it this far. So continue to be wise and use common sense as you approach this. Listen to the directions, and we'll be going through these directions in the, in the next few slides. Um, next slide, please. Wear a mask when outside of your home. And we're gonna have a couple slides to take a look at uh, how to do this and what uh, the different definitions and pictures of masks are like. So we can go to the next slide. So on this graphic, there are three columns. The title is, what type of mask do I need? So let's take a look at the first column. It's a homemade mask or a paper mask. And who is this for? This is for the general public. This is when a person can't socially distance. Um, and if they don't have access to a mask, uh, a scarf or a bandana can be used. I also just saw recently that a, a sleeve from a t-shirt uh, can actually be stretched and used too. And we're gonna talk about how to use a mask properly. Now, the limitations for a cloth mask is that they should be washed after each use. Uh, don't wear them damp or when wet from spit or mucus. Now, the second column is a surgical mask. This is for healthcare workers and patients in healthcare settings. If you have to take your uh, patient that you care for for an appointment, you will be provided with a mask. You should be provided. If not, please ask for one. And so you and the uh, patient should be wearing a mask in any um, healthcare setting. And this is during the patient interactions or routine health procedures. And it's recommended when N95s are not, uh, not available. And we'll talk about that in one second. So the limitations for these masks are that ideally you should be able to discard them after each patient encounter and extended use is preferable to reuse. Now, in the third column is the N95 respirator. This is for healthcare workers who are caring for patients with COVID-19 and performing procedures that put them most at risk of virus exposure. 
Uh, the limitations, ideally, they should discard this after each patient encounter. Um, and I'm sure you've seen stories where people are, because of limitations, uh, are having to reuse them. Not, this is not ideal. Let's go to the next slide to take a look at some examples of masks. So in the first column, uh, if you've been watching TV um, or been on the internet, you see these homemade masks. This is for the general public. And some tips with these homemade masks are, first of all, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a sewing machine. You don't have to have, uh, to be a crafty person. If you have a bandana at home, or even I saw that they, they made one with um, a pillowcase and you just fold it over and you take two hair ties on the ends and what happens is that you cover your mouth with your mouth and your nose with the cloth and the hair ties go behind your ears. This works, the one above it, um, the one above the red one is with some elastic. If you have access to an elastic, that's another option. An important point about homemade masks is if you're going to use them, you wanna make sure that the fabric that they're composed of is not see-through. It's really important that it be a thicker fabric because you, the whole purpose is you want to pr protect uh, others from you and you don't want your uh, air that you are breathing out with any potential secretions um, to get through this. And in addition, you don't also want to breathe anything in. Now in the second column are surgical masks. These are what uh, healthcare workers should wear in the hospital setting or any healthcare setting. And if you're a patient and or a caregiver and you have to go to one of these appointments, this is the type of mask that they should be giving you. Now in this third column, these are the N95 masks. These are really, um, most importantly, these are for healthcare workers. And if you have access to them and you're not a healthcare worker, it would really be, um, great if you could donate them to your local healthcare workers and utilize the first or the second option so that we can protect the healthcare workers who are taking care of patients with COVID-19. In a few slides down the road, what we'll see is that uh, how to properly wear the mask. So let's go to the next slide. Another um, important recommendation is that you wash your hands for 20 seconds. And this is, after, this is your most important tool in preventing spread of coronavirus. And you've, I'm sure you've heard you should sing happy birthday or your song of choice. But the key is when you wash your hands, you wanna wash them with soapy water and you wanna wash the fronts of your hands, the backs of your hands in between your fingers. And that's a really important uh, tool to be able to help uh, decrease uh, the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, for the next slide, it's important to stay socially connected, but physically distant, greater than six feet. So I wanna go spend a little time on this slide. We've um, all heard from the Surgeon General and from the CDC that it's important to stay physically distant and they feel that a distance of six feet is good to protect you from uh, being exposed to um, the coronavirus. And we highly endorse that, but it also limits your contact. And we as humans are, we like to touch people. This is really hard for a lot of people who are huggers or like to shake hands, but this is the time that it is crucial that you follow these recommendations. And so we recommend that you stay socially connected. And we'll talk about a few tips on how to do that. So next slide, please. Now, here is a photo that uh, I took last week in our um, uh, pulmonary rehab setting at our hospital. And this is what we like to call the proper way to socially distance and to wear your mask. So if you take a, a tip or take a look at this, you can see when the, these staff members, the, who are our PFT techs, our pulmonary rehab uh, therapist, and one of our physicians, they wear the mask and it covers their nose and their mouth. 
and their hands, they spread their hands out so that they can't touch the individual on either side of them. This is, these are important tips for you as you go out and about in how to socially distance. Next slide, please. I think this is really important. So limit your access to the news and my recommendation is only reliable news. And um, it's important here that the news can become uh, stressful, it can induce anxiety, and that's for you as the caregiver, that's for the patient, that's even for us as those who provide care to patients and caregivers. It's a very scary time, and uh, it's important to get the news, but it's also important to limit your exposure. I'll give an example of what I do. I like to watch our local news here in Pittsburgh for a half hour in the morning from 6.30 to 7. Gives me an overview of what's going on here. And then I like to watch the Today Show. That's my show of preference. You probably have your own show of preference because that I like to see what's happening um, you know, around the United States and around the world. But what I have noticed is by the time I get to the eight o'clock hour, it's from seven to eight, by the time I get to that second hour, I can feel my own angst increasing. And I'm thinking if this is happening to me and I have a pretty good knowledge of this, I can only imagine what's happening to other people. And when I say listen to reliable news, please make sure you get your, your news from factual sources that are evidence-based. That means the Centers for Disease Control, that means your local hospital, that means the Surgeon General. And those will be my three best tips for reliable sources for news. Next slide, please. So during this time, it's important to identify your emotion. It is completely normal to be stressed and anxious. This is called fear of the unknown. We've not had this before, we are used to be able to do what we want when we want to do it. And now we have limitations placed upon us. And for those of you that are caregivers, you have those additional stresses of being a caregiver and being in a space. And now you are being limited in your ability to get out and about. So it just increases the anxiety level. Back to when I talked at that very first slide to be kind to yourself, be particularly gentle on yourself and to that and to the one you care for. It just is really important. It's these are unprecedented times, and um, we need to like just kind of sit back and focus on our survival skills. Um, next slide, please. So some tips for managing your stress. First of all, acknowledge your emotions. Realize that, geez, I'm on edge. I'm anxious, I'm barking at people, I'm scared, I don't know what's gonna happen. So it's really important that you acknowledge these emotions. It's also important that you monitor your well-being and your response to your emotions. And if you find that you're doing unhealthy behaviors, please try to make sure that you uh, seek help. It, you know, it, this is not the time to be super, super strong and think that uh, you don't need help. You know, we're all in this together. It's really important. And in, later in our um, talk, you'll hear um, some resources that are available to seek help. Uh, next slide, please. Something that uh, is also uh, can help you get through this is to be grateful and positive. You know, it's a privilege if you're able to stay home and you're not on the front lines. Um, it's also a privilege if you are a caregiver uh, or a care provider in the hospital that you have that skill set that you're able to help other people as long as you take good care of yourself as you're doing this. So one recommendation is to try to do one good thing for someone each day. And this might be where you socially connect with someone. You know, you have people who you know from the past that you maybe have lost touch with. It's a good thing every day to check in with someone and to see how they're doing. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is, uh, as I said, unprecedented, unprecedented times. So our spring religious holidays are coming up. So Passover, Easter, Ramadan, whatever your holiday is that you, um, you may practice. So I can't uh, enforce this, reinforce this enough. It's important to maintain social distance. And this is the time to use FaceTime, Zoom, digital ways to connect, or good old fashioned call someone on the telephone. Our recommendations are that you plan to celebrate when the stay at home mandates are lifted. This really, this is not the time to have everyone over to your house for, um, to celebrate the holiday. Uh, it just goes against all the recommendations from the CDC. A, you're not socially distancing yourself and you're just increasing your exposure to someone who might uh, be carrying the disease or you yourself might be carrying. So this is the time for a new tradition and it doesn't mean that you won't get back to your old traditions, but it, this is really what's safest this year. Um, and I have uh, a few questions that I, uh, we can go to our next slide, but I have three things that I also wanted to add to this. Uh, next slide, please. So together is how we get through this. Now, one of the questions that was posed to me is, do you wear a mask in the home? And the CDC is not recommending that you wear a mask in the home, unless of course now you're sick. And if you have COVID symptoms or um, uh, have been exposed to someone, then you really need to quarantine yourself and not be around others. So what does it mean to quarantine? You actually go into a different space in your house and you, you, you don't have interactions and with people. Now that's really challenging if you're the caregiver. And so this is the time that it's really important to call in reinforcements if you have those uh, and to be able to limit this exposure. Um, and by doing uh, this, you can keep yourself self healthier and you can also keep the caregiver healthy. And it's particularly important for patients um, who have respiratory diseases. That uh, is something I'm very familiar with. And um, what happens is what we're finding, uh, what the experts are reporting are that patients who have underlying respiratory illnesses such as asthma or um, pulmonary fibrosis or emphysema, they are at much more risk of um, having complications if they get COVID. So it's really crucial that you do good hand washing, you do the social distancing, you wear the mask when you go out. Um, and then one last thing I'd like to uh, mention is gloves. I really didn't say too much about gloves. Uh, gloves don't replace good hand washing. Um, there are some interesting videos that I've seen uh, on the internet that people are using gloves and they think it's a safety factor. And then what happens is um, they touch their face, they touch their phone when they're out, and it's all this cross-contamination. So it is, if you are going to use gloves, you use them, you throw them away, and you make sure you wash your hands really well, clean your phone off with the wipe, and um, make sure you keep your face clean. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Up next will be Dr. Rajvi Chopi from the Office of Developmental Programs. Let me. You should be unmuted now. Can you hear us? I can. And can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. It looks like there's over 260 folks joining in and appreciate getting to share a bit of the day with you. I know how busy everybody is. <clears throat> I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so just going over some issues in supporting folks with um, mental health needs. But really, what we're going to talk about applies quite broadly. So it, it 
will speak to folks both with and without mental health needs, folks with and without developmental um, or intellectual disabilities, as well as adults and children. And also we're gonna include some resources uh, for uh, where to turn as we move forward. So we can go to the next slide. Now, as a physician and um, involved in public health now and really wanting to make sure we work hard to get this um, pandemic under control as quickly as possible, I just, you know, I always feel it's important to share uh, symptoms of what um, coronavirus or COVID-19 um, looks like. So the, the hallmark symptoms are fever, cough, or shortness of breath. We know that these symptoms can appear in as few as two days after exposure or as long as 15 days after exposure. And that's why the quarantine for 14 days is, is what's recommended when folks may have had an exposure. We also know that the illness that occurs can be very broad, um, including folks that appear to maybe have no symptoms at all or what we call asymptomatic, all the way to folks who become very ill and sometimes die. We also know that older adults and people who have uh, underlying chronic men, uh, medical conditions like heart disease, lung disease, or diabetes seem to be at higher risk for developing some of the more serious complications uh, from COVID-19. We can go on to the next. Now, I also wanted to point out that these symptoms are the emergency warning signs for progression of COVID-19. So if you or somebody you're caring for develop any of these symptoms, it's essential that medical attention is sought immediately. These would include significant um, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, moving air in and out, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, or new onset of confusion or the inability to arouse somebody, somebody who seems um, very sleepy or um, excessively sedated, or having a change in coloring, particularly around the lips or face to blue or grayish. Um, these are all, all signs of not getting enough oxygen um, and are a, a medical emergency. Now, certainly there are other things that could be medical emergencies too, and I don't wanna give the sense that this is the only reason to pursue care emergently, but should any of these occur, please uh, you know, uh, call 911 uh, right away. Go on to the next slide, please. Now, we're fortunate in Pennsylvania that um, the uh, Pennsylvania um, Department of Health uh, has a really uh, robust support um, system, the, the 877 number, 877-PA-HEALTH, uh, um, is available for any sort of questions regarding um, COVID-19. Um, in addition to that's who, who they track the positive cases, but if there are concerns or questions about um, something um, that's occurred, uh, you can go ahead and give them a call. They also give live daily briefings um, that are accessible via the internet. Um, and here's uh, uh, included three website addresses that all go to the same um, broadcast. And, and typically those occur around 2 p.m. Um, each day. Um, it's usually the uh, Secretary of the Department of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine, oftentimes the governor um, and other um, state officials join. Go on to the next slide. Now, Caregiving in times of crisis, as Kathleen mentioned, as, as Nancy's going to go into um, more detail in a bit, it really comes with a lot of, of challenges. And we sort of uh, certainly understand the uh, significant stressors that, that you're facing. Um, oftentimes when people are uh, working from home and then also um, doing caregiving duties, that sort of compounds um, the situation. I'm not gonna spend any more time on this right now, just, um, for the interest of time, um, and I know that um, Nancy's going to cover a bit of this as well. So why don't we go on to the next slide. Now, what is it about right now that makes um, supporting folks with intellectual um, developmental disabilities as well as mental health uh, issues um, uh, more vulnerable? I think that the uncertainty is, is one of them. You know, this is a the novel, as they call it, a novel coronavirus. This is something that the world has not seen before. We truly are learning more every single day about this disease and um, new um, things to be optimistic about and new things to be concerned about. So certainly everybody is sort of um, unclear of, of what comes next. And as probably you know, the guidance that comes from the 
health centers like CDC and the Department of Health really is, is, is changing so frequently because as we learn more, we want to make sure that everybody's getting the most um, recent and, and most accurate um, information. But what that can do is also lead to some sense of insecurity about, um, you know, knowing what the best things to do are. And then certainly the uncertainty that is involved with the illness itself in terms of not understanding why it is that some people progress and have only mild symptoms and why some people progress and ultimately die. And sometimes that can occur very quickly. So all of those things, I think, sort of um, underlie um, some of the um, exacerbation or increase of un uncertainty that can put folks on a less stable footing in their world. The other thing that I think cannot be um, overstated is the disruption of routines that occurs um, as a result of this particular pandemic. Um, we're all sort of at stay at home, um, those of us who aren't um, able to uh, work in, um, in a sort of essential uh, businesses. Um, and so the folks that we're supporting have um, disruption of their daytime routines, whether it be school or a job or sometimes um, day programs, um, you know, access to those things is, is lost. Um, sometimes that can be associated with um, forgetting to do our regular things like take medication. So the vulnerability of sort of um, coming off medications for folks with uh, mental health issues is really attenuated right now. And likewise, nighttime routines can be disrupted. Um, and with that can um, become a loss of good healthy sleep patterns, which is such an important part of staying well, as we'll talk about in another slide or two. Uh, and then um, finally, the disruption of access to mental health professionals, scheduled appointments with the psychiatrist, with the primary care physician, with the counselor, therapist, or behavior specialist, all of that has been um, disrupted um, and is going to lead to this sort of increased vulnerability right now. So we'll go on to the next slide. So as you are supporting individuals with, with needs, uh, really to be mindful for changes because um, right now you are going to um, sort of have to play that, that extra role in um, supervision and to be sometimes that link between individuals and uh, their health care, particularly now that much health care is going to be delivered via telephone or um, if we're fortunate enough to have a video access to by, um, you know, a, a video exchange telemedicine as a way of preventing spread of the disease during the height of the pandemic. So really to be mindful for changes. And when it comes to mental health stability, we know that sleep patterns are one of the key indicators that something may be getting a little bit off course. Um, so when you start to see disruption of sleep patterns, not sleeping through the night, not falling asleep, waking up excessively early, to really think, hmm, maybe we better reach out to, to the prescriber or the counselor um, to discuss this before it becomes a much bigger issue. Likewise, appetite changes really should be um, a potential cue for things getting off track, even before mood changes become more evident or energy changes. Um, and that leads, sort of leads into the energy level that if folks are becoming more lethargic or on the opposite, more activated or sometimes even hypomanic or manic, those would be reasons to, to reach out. Keeping an eye on what people's interests are. Um, now, certainly I think when folks are kind of stuck at home more, it's not unusual to lose interest in things that maybe were fun, maybe watching some TV becomes boring when it becomes hours of TV or playing certain games becomes less interesting when there are just endless hours to fill with those games. But you really, um, trying to separate out what might be boredom with excessive exposure versus lack of pursuit of things that this person has genuinely cherished throughout the course of, of most of their lives, to pay attention to that. Also to pay attention to the, th the person's thought process. You know, are thoughts seeming as clear, as logical, and as ordered as they typically are? Or might there be some suggestion that things are getting a little bit off track? 
keeping an eye out for um, increased substance use. Again, when these uh, routines are disrupted, there can be an increased risk for excessive smoking or sometimes drug use um, or alcohol use. And the other thing I'll mention about alcohol use and supporting folks that maybe have a history of a lot of alcohol use now that state stores are closed and access to bars might be might be more um, limited, um, the risk for alcohol withdrawal is, is higher. So um, to, again, to be uh, aware of that and to reach out to healthcare providers if there are concerns for that. And then finally, as always, um, looking out for any potential safety concerns. Is a person having any um, thoughts about wanting to hurt themselves or, or to hurt others that, you know, like the, like the warning signs for COVID, a call to 911, safety concerns such as those would be emergency calls to the provider as well. So what can we do? And, and I think that one of the key things that we can do in addition to being vigilant to all of those factors is to really try to um, establish a new normal during this you know, unprecedented time of uh, abnormal days. Um, to sort of create with is for folks that are at stay at home routines to really create new routines and, and have some uh, predictability and sameness built into the day. So if a person typically maybe was at work from, you know, nine o'clock until four o'clock to maybe build something in into the day specifically after breakfast is completed, that is um, the first transition of the day. And then, uh, you know, maybe it's an activity or maybe it's some, some time with a book or some TV time or um, um, some one-on-one -on -one interactions with folks in the house, but really to have that sort of predictable through the day. And sometimes creating a visual schedule can be very helpful um, for folks um, to sort of know what might be coming next. Um, absolutely, as I mentioned before, don't hesitate to reach out to the providers if these concerns um, do occur. And um, to be aware that um, many providers do offer these telehealth or telepsychiatry um, um, appointments and, and support uh, in, in ways that they weren't able to before. In fact, the government has even changed some of the rules to make that more um, accessible um, to individuals. If we can go on to the next. Now, um, these next few slides I actually have a, a adapted from a um, publication that uh, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry came out with um, called Talking to Children About Coronavirus. I, I think that it, these, these steps or thoughts are really applicable regardless of who you're talking to about um, coronavirus and, and really can help to create a, an environment that reinforces safety and reinforces a person's uh, sense of, of security in the world. And really to make sure that you have a, a, a nice, open and supportive environment um, at the home setting or wherever the support setting is occurring, where people feel as though they are free to ask questions and free to um, express their emotions. And to always, uh, as best as possible, answer questions honestly. Um, and that can be difficult sometimes because sometimes the answers are not easy to give. Always remember, however, that it's okay to say, I don't know to a question and, and don't feel like you have to have the perfect answer for every question that the individual might have. And then the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, particularly if you're dealing with somebody younger or maybe with somebody that might have difficulty processing a lot of information is that, um, you can feel free to just answer the question that's asked. I think sometimes we have a tendency to want to over explain things, but to keep things sort of um, sort of short and factual and direct and then see what questions come after that. And if there's more questions about it, then you can go into uh, more explanation. Always keeping in mind the age and developmental level of the person that, that you're supporting um, and using words and concepts that will be understood. Um, it's important, as Kathleen indicated, you know, always looking for accurate and up-to-date information. And we've got some nice resources that you'll have um, as part of this um, handout um, where you can turn for um, those things. 
uh, can be frustrating, but be prepared to repeat information and explanations several times because this can really be a way of folks who are feeling less secure to sort of seek some reassurance by just sort of testing. Do you, if I ask again, is it going to be the same same response? We'll go on to the next slide. To acknowledge and validate folks' feelings um, and their reactions. Um, let them know that you think their questions are important and appropriate and that you're going to um, be as reassuring as, po as possible, but don't make unrealistic promises. You know, I think it's tempting to want to tell folks that, you know, everybody's going to be safe in a, a situation like this. Um, but when you turn on the news and you hear um, death tolls rising or, you know, deaths being reported, it's hard to sort of bring that together with a statement like everybody's going to be safe. But, you know, I, I think that a, a, a different way of saying that is doctors and that, you know, healthcare workers will always do the best they can and they'll always make sure you get the best care possible. Um, you know, to let folks know that there are lots of people in this world that are really helping um, and that those are the heroes of the world and that should we need them, they're going to be there for us. Um, and to remember that people sort of take the lead of uh, folks that are closest to them and, and how you're responding to the news and the outbreak will, will really oftentimes set the tone for how they're going to respond or how they're going to emotionally process things. As Kathleen mentioned, you know, sort of avoid excessive television, particularly with frightening images, as this can sort of become a bit overwhelming at times. We'll go on to the next, please. Um, and then uh, for those who have experienced serious illness or losses in the past, um, to recognize that they may feel particularly vulnerable and that extra support and attention may be needed um, to enhance their uh, feelings of safety. We'll go on to the next slide. And, and so I just want to go very quickly through the next several slides about some additional resources that you may find helpful before we turn it over to my friend, uh, Nancy Murray. Um, uh, this this is actually a, a new support, and it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. It's a statewide uh, support and referral helpline. It's free. It's available 24/7. It just came online um, at the end of last week. Um, it's um, staffed by skilled and compassionate staff that will respond to those struggling with anxiety and other challenging emotions um, due to the COVID-19 emergency. The staff at the helpline uh, will refer callers to community-based resources that can further help uh, individuals meet their needs. It was created by the Department of Human Services and the Center for Community Resources, or CCR, and the helpline staff are trained to be accessible, culturally competent and skilled at assisting individuals in the intellectual disabilities and autism community, as well as anyone else who might have needs, teens, adults, special populations, and their supporters. So um, staff understand the, that will be on the phones, understand the principles of trauma-informed care, and are there to listen, assess needs, and to triage calls. So um, as again, this will be in, in the handout. So um, you know, please take advantage of, of, of this uh, remarkable resource that we have here in Pennsylvania. Let's go on to the next. Another really nice resource I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, share is called aid in PA or autism and intellectual disabilities in Pennsylvania. This is a website that will have daily programming available that is related to the um, COVID-19 issues, as well as various issues pertinent in the lives of individuals with intellectual disabilities, as well as autism. And, and these are supported by the healthcare quality units and the Autism Services Education Resources and Training, or ASSERT. Um, we can go on to the next slide. And again, um, these are two web addresses to contact um, the healthcare quality units and assert um, um, directly for access to their um, variety of resources. They've really done a wonderful job in, in, in creating things. We'll go on to the next slide. And then there are just sort of many resources that were in place prior to um, the pandemic that still um, are very important very important, the National Suicide Prevention Line, both in English and Spanish. We have in Pennsylvania a text crisis line where if you text the letters PA to 741741, you can contact somebody um, via text regarding uh, um, emotional concerns that you're having. There's a veterans crisis line, a disaster distress helpline, uh, get hot, uh, 
Help Now hotline for folks with substance use disorders, Pennsylvania Sexual Assault Helpline, and finally, the National D Domestic Violence Helpline. Moving on to the next. Uh, and then I also included some web addresses for some reliable sources of COVID-19 information, the Centers for Disease Control, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, as well as um, the Office of Developmental Programs has a, a page on our website, myodp.org, that um, lists um, pertinent issues um, for um, folks that the office supports um, related to COVID at, at that address. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy Murray. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, okay. we can hear you Okay, now. good. In the Thank interest you. of time, I'm gonna go quickly through the slides. Um, and try not to repeat what's already uh, been uh, been said. Go ahead, Heather, please. So some of the universal fears that family caregivers are facing right now, um, obviously like all of us, that uh, uh, someone that we love will be testing positive for the virus, need to be hospitalized. We see this on the news every day. Uh, families are also uh, very fearful of uh, becoming unemployed or underemployed. Uh, how will we pay our rent, our mortgage, our utility bills? How will we pay for food and medications? Um, and social distancing. Uh, in less than two months, social distancing now dictates how we live our lives. Uh, some places are totally closed to us, including our places of worship. Some businesses are closed or only open a few hours. Uh, people are wearing masks in public. And the question for families is, will this be enough to keep us safe? Uh, next slide. So family give, care, caregivers are profoundly fearful. Um, for family members uh, who are being cared for out of the home, in hospitals and nursing homes and community homes for people with disabilities, um, Many families now are not allowed. We're prohibited from visiting our family members. Um, and we're, we're extremely fearful that our family member or the staff that work with them will become sick. This is very hard uh, for people who have communication challenges, uh, our family members with intellectual disabilities who simply cannot understand um, why mom and dad or brother and sister cannot visit with them. And uh, family members are, are just scared to death that their family member could uh, be hospitalized and they will not be able to, um, to visit. Next slide. Uh, for family members uh, who are being cared for in the family home, family caregivers have a, um, uh, a different group of worries. So for example, Many families worry about what if I have a chronic illness? What if I myself, I'm 60 years old, uh, I have a chronic illness, my daughter who uh, has Down syndrome and 40 years old living at home with me, what if I have a chronic illness and I can no longer provide that care? Who else is trained to provide the necessary care if I can't? Uh, many families of folks with uh, uh, all types of illnesses and chronic disabilities, chronic illnesses, um, do not have others who can provide care. They're single caregivers and they're extremely fearful and worried about what's going to happen to their family member if they can no longer provide the care. Even if I do have other caregivers, Who's going to be willing to come into my home to care for my family member under these current circumstances? And again, what will happen if my family member needs to be hospitalized and I cannot visit? Who would be there to comfort them? Who would be there to um, help the, uh, the staff in the hospital communicate with them? These are um, profound fears that family members are sharing with me now each and every day. Uh, next slide, Heather. 
Also, uh, for family members who are being cared for in the family home, um, isolation. Um, again, especially for elderly caregivers and their middle-aged uh, children, uh, maybe the uh, elderly woman taking care of her elderly husband who's had a stroke, maybe a middle-aged gentleman taking care of his wife who has multiple sclerosis, uh, the feeling of, of complete and utter isolation. Um, Dr. Chirpus mentioned uh, the anxiety that can uh, result from a loss of routines that can be very destabilizing, especially for people, for example, on the autism spectrum, for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, it's very hard when you're a, a caregiver for somebody whose life revolves around schedule and routines from the morning that, that from the moment that you wake up in the morning till the moment that they put their heads down on the pillow at night. Um, it can be both physically and emotionally exhausted. And then there are family members, uh, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, who uh, cannot work from home but yet they are now home caring for someone and uh, they are extremely worried because they do not have access to uh, paid leave and uh, now we're coming up on a month in Pennsylvania where people have been staying at home. Many people are, uh, they've gone through their sick time, their vacation time um, and they're wondering what their next steps could possibly be. Next slide. Um, there's also now the fear of rationing care. As COVID-19 cases increase, uh, I think a lot of people are beginning to wonder uh, what will happen if there's not enough acute care equipment, primarily ventilators, uh, to meet the uh, increasing demand of patients with the virus who need these life-sustaining um, equipment. Um, so we know that healthcare professionals and states are developing protocols, guidelines, standards of care for deciding who will and who will not have access um, to these treatments. Uh, just on March 22nd, um, Pennsylvania introduced uh, interim crisis standards of care for pandemic guidelines. Uh, at least six other states that I know of have introduced similar standards and uh, disability attorneys and advocacy organizations across the country um, have now countered with uh, complaints to the Office of Civil Rights uh, in the uh, United States Department of Health and Human Services, um, stipulating that such directives discriminate against people with disabilities and chronic medical issues and violate federal law. I think this is something that um, we're going to hear more about uh, with increasing frequency in the days and weeks to come. And this is something that um, family caregivers, again, are profoundly fearful of. What if my family member uh, with a disability or chronic medical issue um, becomes sick, um, is in the hospital, what is the chance that my family member would be denied care? And again, I may not be there. I may not be allowed in the hospital. So who will advocate for my family member? Next slide. So what family members can do, I'm gonna run through this quickly because the other two um, speakers have already mentioned most, most of this. Um, watch for physical signs of stress. Uh, are you becoming exhausted? Do you have headaches, losing your appetite, or, or eating more than usual? Um, first of all, identify and acknowledge your feelings. You have a right to all of your feelings. Maybe you're feeling anxious or fearful. Uh, some family members, frankly, now are feeling very depressed, very angry. Um, Many are becoming overwhelmed by sadness, having trouble remembering things, having trouble concentrating, having difficulty making decisions. Uh, these are all physical and emotional signs of stress that um, frankly are very common to, uh, to human beings under um, extreme stress. 
So what do we, um, what do we recommend? Engage in practical ways to relax that work for you. There's all different lists of things people can do out there, um, but you have to find what really works for you. Um, maybe exercising is not your thing. Maybe exercising for 30 minutes is not your thing. So maybe you just do deep breathing for five minutes. Maybe you take a walk for five minutes. Do what works for you. Um, as as uh, Kathleen said, take care of yourself. You know, eat healthy, well-balanced meals. Um, exercise, sleep, avoid alcohol. I put excessive in there because sometimes a glass of wine does help once in a while. Um, and if you do take medication um, for your own health to, uh, to make sure that you stay healthy, make sure that you do that. Next slide. As both Kathleen and Greg said, take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, especially including social media. Um, everything on the news right now uh, can be very upsetting. Uh, I've started recommending HGTV to people. Uh, it's a way to uh, you know, just watch what regular people are doing and getting away from the news. I also um, remind families um, to take time off without feeling guilty. Uh, caregiving is a 24-7 uh, occupation for many families, um, and we need to take time off, and we can't feel guilty about that. And the other thing is um, to connect with others, um, and to start connecting with others before you feel a touch of cabin fever um, settling in. Um, connecting with others before that sense of being alone just overwhelms you. Whether it's just a, a brief phone call with a neighbor or, you know, Skype with a family member. Um, talk with other families who are going through what you're going through. If you have a child on the autism spectrum, reach out to some other families who know exactly what you're going through. Um, if you're on the waiting list for services, talk to another family who's in the same boat as you are. You know, talk about what you're feeling, talk about the stress, talk about, you know, reliable information that, that can help both of you get through. Um, next slide. Family givers need support. They need emotional support. They need physical assistance from other people. Um, you know, if, if you have a neighbor who's a family caregiver, call them up, ask them if you can go to the grocery store for them. Try to help, even, in, even within these uh, social distancing days, see what you can do. Maybe you could mow somebody's lawn. Maybe you could go pick up the mail for somebody. See what you can do to physically assist. Um, emotionally support a family caregiver. Call them on the phone, talk with them for five minutes. You'll never know how much that phone call could mean to somebody. Um, we also need to make um, our society uh, more aware um, of the financial impact of care provided by family caregivers, especially during um, this COVID-19 um, crisis. You know, a lot of um, Americans have no idea the amount of um, care the family caregivers provide. Uh, the last number I saw was there are probably about 50 million caregivers in the United States. Nobody um, truly understands the billions and billions of dollars of care that are provided by family caregivers. And it's something that um, we need to make more um, Americans aware of. And we also need to make policymakers and legislators more aware of the tremendous um, burdens, but also the amount of care that family caregivers are providing, especially right now in this crisis, when paid caregivers cannot come into family homes. Um, we're relying even more on family caregivers and um, it's time that paid family leave was um, 
authorized and funded in this country. Last slide. I want to remind family caregivers that we're more resilient than sometimes we um, have the strength to recognize. Um, right now, certainly, uh, we have a lot of fears. We're separated from our family members. Um, we're worried about how long we're going to be able to care for our family members, to protect them, uh, to advocate for them. Um, However, each and every day, today, tomorrow, the next day, family caregivers need to remember all that we achieve on a daily basis, um, all of the care that we do provide, uh, whether it's that retired couple taking care of their son who returned from Iraq with a traumatic brain injury, whether it's that single mom taking care of her adult son on the autism spe spectrum, Maybe it's that uh, middle-aged woman taking care of her husband who has cancer and is receiving in-home hospice, um, or the young couple taking care of their son who's vent dependent and requires 24-7 care every day in their home. Um, family caregivers need to remember all that they do each and every day and last but not least, I think one of the things that's going to get family caregivers through is the belief that no pandemic has ever lasted forever. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to unmute all of our panelists now, and we will have a very short question and answer session for anyone's question who doesn't get addressed, we will send out the questions themselves and the answers through email to anyone who registered. I know there have been a lot of questions about masks and in the efforts of saving time, I'm going to save those for answers via email so that we can really compile for you the best practices for masks themselves. I think that most or all of the panelists should be unmuted now. We did get two questions about specific um, diagnoses, and those were if anyone has any tips for helping those with memory loss or dementia, or children with autism while quarantined at home. Greg, are you still on? I am still on. I'm going to have to exit shortly, but if I could maybe start this and, and then others could, could, could follow up, um, be happy to, to do that. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it's going to be varied. Um, depending on the individual's interests and, and, and needs, but uh, for both actually, folks with autism as well as folks with dementia, um, I, I, I really can't um, underscore the importance of trying to establish some new routines um, and sort of sense of um, safety and um, normalcy within the context of this, you know, pandemic when folks are are staying at home and uh, the one thing I um, think is um, only beginning to truly get the uh, appreciation and importance that it deserves is the the role of um, interactions with music and percussion and and beats um, to folks with um, both again autism and um, folks with with dementia um, if, if anybody um, is supporting anybody with um, dementia, whether it be Alzheimer's type or other types, and have not yet seen the amazing documentary called Alive Inside um, about um, a um, music therapy program that was started for folks with dementia, I mean, it's, it's really quite remarkable and um, stunning how Im important music can be in, in the lives of individuals. And again, um, it's something that in the context of the emergency, we may forget that it um, is one of the things that we have in, in store. Greg, this is Nancy. 
The only thing I would add to that is to the extent possible that you keep a person's routine as, as close to what they were used to doing before we're all forced to stay home. Um, I know that my son um, lives in a community home. I've not seen him very much for the last month. Um, he has Down syndrome and he's starting down the road um, with some cognitive loss. And um, in talking with his staff, we decided that one of the things that will work best for him under these circumstances is he gets up at the regular time that he used to before this crisis. Um, you know, he gets his shower, he eats his breakfast, you know, he helps to make breakfast, he eats his breakfast, helps to clean up the breakfast, you know, then, then there's a time when things are going to look a little bit different, but instead of driving to work, you know, he's able to go in the van and do some, some errands with the staff, coming home, eating lunch, but to the extent possible, in the, in the late afternoon, he's still there with his housemate, but, you know, they're, they're doing their laundry, they're making dinner, you know, watching the news, trying to keep the day and I know how hard this is, but trying to keep the day as close to pos as possible, especially around meals, you know, when people wake up, when they go to sleep, you know, do they do their laundry on Wednesday, then do the laundry on Wednesday. And I know this is exhausting. It's exhausting for families. It's exhausting for staff. But um, remember, this is going to end, and then people are going to go back to um, the lives they were leading before. So to the extent that we can keep their day looking as similar as possible, that transition after the crisis, when the stay at home orders are lifted, that transition will hopefully be a little bit easier for people. I think, thank you so much for those answers. So that we don't keep you here too long, I'm going to let Dr. Heidi Donovan wrap us up. She is one of the co-directors of our center here. And we have made notes of all of the questions that you've asked that we did not get a chance to address. And we'll make sure that we do get an answer for those to you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, on behalf of our team at the National Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Family Support here at the University of Pittsburgh, I really want to thank our speakers, Dr. Kathy Lindell, Dr. Greg Turpus, and Nancy Murray for agreeing to share their expertise and advice with us, uh, all of us on such short notice. I also want to give an additional thanks to Nancy for her partnership in this effort, for her words of wisdom, and for helping to spread the word about this webinar through her many networks. Uh, finally, I want to thank each of you for taking time out of your busy day during this crazy time uh, to spend an hour and a little bit more with us. This is our first public webinar. Um, and we're just thrilled you joined us. Uh, as Heather mentioned at the beginning of the hour, we'd urge you to complete the survey that will come to your email inbox later this afternoon or tomorrow. We're committed to having regular webinars for family caregivers and your input is vital to designing our programs. So thank you again for joining us. We will be sure to keep in touch and to send you answers uh, to all of your great questions. Thank you again and be well, stay safe and stay home. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.